Good morning, and welcome to Practical Christian Lessons. I am Joshua Pearsall, and if you've never been here before, welcome to the channel. Um, today is going to be a Wesleyan essay, but we're reading these from the Reflecting God Study Bible. Before we get into our essay, just a few quick announcements. If you saw our Monday video, you've already seen these. Skip forward a minute or two. Um, moving forward, we will have a, a change in the, the three videos we're doing weekly. We're still going to be doing three videos, but instead of having two read-throughs every week on top of our Monday series, our two series that we're working through, um, we are going to be maybe still doing two, two read-throughs, just depending on what I feel the Lord is calling me to do and what I've prepared for that given week. But we're going to be spending one of those two videos to do um, various apologetics things, right? We do a lot of Protestant apologetics here, and we're getting more and more into that. But it's not just going to be Protestant apologetics. We're going to get into other things as well. We'll cover some, probably some specific Wesleyan theological topics, kind of whatever I feel the Lord is kind of pushing me into to make a video on that week. Uh, sorry if this clicking is loud. Um, I think that's it. And on the point of Protestant apologetics, watch our Monday video, um, and you will you will see that our reading of Jacob Arminius coincidentally led into exactly that, and why um, sort of the Roman Catholic model of addressing dissensions, which is the oration we've been reading through, which, addressing Christian dissensions, dissensions among Christians, and varying beliefs, they are not able to solve the problem they say they're able to solve. And still very accurate for today in my experience so worth going and checking that out for anyone who has not been following along with these essays um the current essay series we are going through we are just reading through the essays in this bible you will find a playlist in the doobly doo below and they there's they're definitely flowing in an order they're, they're covering a topic even though they're kind of spread across the whole thing um sorry about the edit there i might have to double check something we are now on essay Becoming a Holy Community. Um, the last essay was Being Holy Like God. And the essays leading up to that was talking about sanctification and what the power of transforming grace and those types of things. So if you don't know those are, go watch those videos. Um, if you have this study Bible, it's going to be page 1318 and 1319 where these essays are housed between. So we are now going to be read becoming a holy community and if you're new to wesleyan theology in general um pursuing scriptural holiness living out scriptural holiness both in your own individual practices but also much more especially in the social aspects and the command of god to be in community um as wesley himself said i don't know if they're going to quote it in this essay it's been a bit since i read this um, there is no holiness but social holiness where he and he meant by that quote he was talking about living in community and being together so let's get into it early in genesis we meet god the problem solver his perfect creation has been spoiled corrupted by human sin it becomes so bad in fact that god destroys much of his creation in a great flood genesis 6 through 9 but the corrupting disease remains, and so does the breach between God and the human creatures made in his image. But when humanity reaches its sinful worst, God is at his gracious best. In the course of human history, God chose one person, Abraham, Genesis 12, through whom he proposed to create a holy community and bless the world. He promised this man, later called Abraham, he was Abram before, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 3. God designated Abraham's descendants, the nation Israel, to serve as a light to the nations. Isaiah 42, 6. Exhorting them, be holy because I am holy. Leviticus eleven forty five. Then when the timing was perfect, God focused all his light and holiness into a single beam in the incarnate Christ. Jesus came to be the light of the world. John eight twelve. He also gathered him around himself men and women to whom he passed the lamp, Matthew 5, 14. These men and women, at first primarily Jewish, then a mixture of Jews and non-Jews, became God's new and final version of the homely community. Its composition may have changed, but its mission has not. God intends to reconcile the world through this holy community, which is his church. We fulfill the great task of bringing God and the world together again. Certain characteristics must be present within the church. First of all, we must be holy. 
In the language of the New Testament, we are to be saints. Today, that term typically is used in reference to very, a very religious person now dead, like St. Francis or St. Augustine. It is also used to describe someone who is overly tolerant, as in, she is such a saint, I could never put up with him as a husband. In the New Testament, this term is used to describe a person who has been consecrated to God, set apart for his service. With this privilege comes the obligation to be holy. As the Apostle Paul says, For he chose us and him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Ephesians 1.4 God's people, the saints, are to model what God is like. By our holiness, we reflect God to a darkened world. It may seem naive to imagine that holiness is possible in an unholy world or that holy lives can have an impact on others, but never underestimate the power of God's grace. It was this grace that brought us to spiritual life, Ephesians 2, 6-7, and that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, Titus 2, 12. Having understood God's passion to be reconciled to his creation and having experienced the riches of his grace, we were optimistic about what God can do in this world. We know that sin's most deadly poison finds its antidote in God's grace. Personal holiness grows best in a holy community. There I see models of godliness on which I can pattern my own pursuit. There I am continually reminded of our shared purpose. In the church I find support and encouragement to keep going. When the road of Christ's likeness becomes an uphill climb, in the holy community, I know that people will love and support me, even if I stumble on the way to sainthood. Characterizing all the relationships within the holy community, and between it and the world, must be love. After all, the God we represent describes himself as the source and embodiment of love. 1 John 4, 7-8 It was love that first prompted God to seek reconciliation and to create the church. And Jesus held up love as his community's distinguishing mark. John 13, 35. How does a holy community actually accomplish its purpose of bringing God's light to the world? The Bible makes clear that one important way is through worship. Consider how much of Israel's law had to do with its sacrifices, festivals, holy places, ceremonies, the priesthood, and the tabernacle. All aspects of worship. The New Testament picture although somewhat altered, still emphasizes worship as an important function of our mission. The church has become the temple, 1 Corinthians 3.16, and Christians are a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2.5, who offer sacrifices of praise, Hebrews 13.15, and prayers as incense, Revelation 8.3. But how can worship help us be a light to the world? In worship, the holy community must fully experience most fully experiences the reconciliation that has become its mission. There she meets with her God, and from there she goes out to help others meet him. In worship, she remembers the region she exists. From worship, she derives the confidence to shine as a light to the world. The holy community also carries out its mission by being God's hands and feet in service to others. The true garment of holiness is not the spotless white robe, unsullied by contact with corrupt humanity. But the towel Jesus put on when he washed his disciples' feet. There is, as John Wesley said, no holiness but social holiness. To humanity adrift in the dark, God desires to send his beam of holy love, to light their way to safety in him. Graced to mirror God's nature into sin's light, the holy community reflects that gracious light, and the ancient breach is healed. That was Steve Linux. Um, if you've been on the following our channel for a bit, you know that we've talked about a lot of the things in the essay, if not all those things. That is something I'm I'm very, very passionate about and very emphatic on. And it's worth noting here, and this is an important thing for anyone who is interested in apologetics, as we brought up in the start of the video, is acknowledging that the church fails far too often in this exact aspect of being the holy community. There, there are so many ways in which we as the church fail, and that is a point in pointing to the fact that we all still need Jesus. And that is so, so important to have that hard conversation with people. Not right away, you know, if someone's like, oh, I've been hurt by the church and that's why I'm not there. You don't just immediately have to bust out. It's because we're all sinners and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. You can, you can be friends with them first before you get to that point. Um, 
but is a genuine acknowledgement when someone says stuff like that, that yes, the church has failed, that this was a failure of whatever church you went to, and they need to repent of that for whatever reason, if there, if there is a genuine harm, not um, some of the things that some people would lump into harm. And I'll just get into an example of that here in a second. But when people are actually genuinely hurt and the church has genuinely failed, we need to own up to that as a whole. It doesn't matter if it wasn't your church. It doesn't matter if it was across the world. We still need to own up to it. Part of Israel's liturgical messages in the Psalms and throughout the history of the Old Testament is the people always repenting of the sins of their nation even if they weren't necessarily the ones who did it. If you read the Psalms, the people of the future repent for the sins of the past. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole dialogue of what that exactly looks like. That does not necessarily mean whatever people want to load on to what that looks like. But it is important, at least in the minimum, of acknowledging where there has been wrong done and then moving forward with that in mind and not trying to diminish it and act as if it didn't happen or as if it doesn't matter, because it does. Um, just before I get too lost off, tro off topic, examples of things that are not genuine church hurt, and this is an actual complaint I have heard, is my parents made me go to worship every Sunday. And that, that was their complaint. That is why they left the church. Um, I, if that is you, then I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that for a lot of people, your parents make you go to things you don't want to go to all the time, not just church. Um, I'm not sure if that was their actual reason. If it was, that was one, a terrible reason, but two, probably an excuse to cover something else. And if that's you, that's my same same challenge to you. If, if your issue is something is your parents made you go to it every week, um, I want you to reflect on all the things your parents made you go to that you never wanted to go to and see if you have those same feelings for those. If not, there is absolutely something deeper you need to address there. Um, as for all of us here, I, I want this series of reading through especially the holiness essays yes to be encouraging and to be helpful and as it talked about christ there is the ultimate pointer into what holiness looks like for us both individually and as a society as a part of the kingdom of god what it looks like to live in a holy community i also want to be very important that it is supposed to be challenging to us as well the call to holiness is not a request from the lord it's a command which i know we struggle with in our western culture of authority and being told by someone you have to do this but the lord doesn't make it an option does perfect obedience to these things is your salvation hinge on that no absolutely not are you expected to always be perfectly obedient in a fallen world no there there's reason in first john 2 it says i've written these things so that you do not sin but if anyone does sin they have an advocate with the father there is forgiveness for your sins when you fall short the mark is perfection, even though we won't hit that mark. We are still called to do it and to strive our best to do it. And when we fail, there is forgiveness and grace and mercy for that with the Lord's beautiful and endless and deep, steadfast love and mercy and patience with us fragile humans who are only here before we are then back to dust. That is so important to keep in mind. So with that, you guys go in peace. Have a wonderful day. God bless.